Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Not Church. No dogma, no doctrine, no bravo, Sierra. Yeah, just mysticism and the exploration of the ineffable <clears throat> mystery and what the heck is going on with my teleprompter? Mystery <laughs> uh, with a capital E, just mysticism with a capital E and mystery with a capital M. And if you've been following Dot Church for a while, please subscribe and thanks for your support. I'm Peter Panagor, a two-time near-death experiencer and a lifelong mystical experiencer, ex-clergy, ex-Catholic, ex-Orthodox, ex-professional religious who isn't and hasn't been a believer for 40 years. I'm a knower of unconditional love. If you're here for the first time, I'd like to give you a shout out for Shaman Oaks because he's been bringing a lot of people here. Welcome. Not Church is a progressive series. The video, Jesus the Code Switcher, lays groundwork for this entire Not Church. The link is below. <clears throat> Today, blameless in love, did killing Jesus save us from hell by request? At Not Church, I want and I hope and I try creating a space to taste the radiant flow between us and among us, a sacred space here. In heaven's math, one plus one makes three when people of the light are gathered together with focus. Let's begin with a few breaths this morning in centering silence. Beginners, it's like a, a butterfly resting on your palm, a simple prayer riding up your breath and down your breath, up to your third eye, down your spine, into your navel, to the pit of your stomach on the exhale, and then riding back up your spine again, feeling your back as you go, inhaling with focus, breathing in control, right into your third eye, feeling the skin right there on the frontal lobe. You follow your breath, return to your prayer. It's the basic style. <clears throat> It's a beginner style and it's powerful and it's effective. And I'm, I'm always a beginner. Every, every time I start up with my practice, I have to begin with focus, just like everybody else. Be the arrow and the bow and aim for the center of all there is with your heart. So let's begin as we always do with three ohms and then we're gonna center in. Center in. Today, blameless in love, did killing Jesus save us from hell? Or, as it was actually asked to me, how could crucifying Jesus absolve anyone of their sins? Did you see, these, <laughs> did you see Jesus when you died? 
I'm often asked. Some near-death experiencers do. I know one or two. Jesus was a no-show for me. Nowhere to be seen. He didn't save me from my sins. He didn't save the world from sin either. He did save Howard Storm from hell, who was not a Christian at the time. I had been a born-again charismatic Christian, albeit a backsliding mystic. Who saved me from my purgative place? The self-evident and overwhelming light alone containing all there is, was, and will be in the multiverse and beyond infinite creativity, maker and consistent creator of always now, love and light eternal. That's who saved me, ineffable, unimaginable, love, isness saved me, remade me. Good Christian, call it Christ consciousness if you want to. Free of charge, an eternal kiss to the lips of my soul, opening me, infilling me. Who saved me? Love and light beyond words. What did Jesus teach? Love and light, healing and wholeness, welcome and mercy, joy and peace. At that moment, I understood the wisdom of the Javier Vavier, the YHWH, infinity. I learned needs no religion. God needs no religion. Above human conception, above human understanding, humans use religion to give shape to the unshapeable. Jesus became that shape. And it was easier to use his crucifixion to bring home a message. He became the link between heaven and earth for millions of people. But did the man Jesus, who came preaching love and light, need to die as he did to free us? Does his blood wash us clean? Not in the way we've been taught. His death didn't open the doors of heaven. His life did. Did he take on the sins of the world? I'm not going to scour the Bible and the history of theology to present a coherent argument or to convince anybody, or most likely not convince a lot of literalist Christians. When I arrived in the world again, for the first time in this life, <laughs> oh, tricky, tricky. Tricky, tricky teleprompter. You tricky, tricky teleprompter. Oh, bearing with me. I'm not going to scour. See, I, I really do read what I wrote. I'm not going to scour the Bible in the history of theology to present an argument or to convince or most likely not convince Am I blushing? A literalist Christian. When I arrived in the world, born into the body of baby Peter, I was born into the sins, the structure, the struggle, the matrix, the suffering, the conflicts, the hurt, and the love, and the beauty of the world. When Jesus was born, it was the same for him. And just like you too. I probably should have done a talk on what sin is, but we're going to summarize it here as the hurt we cause each other in the world. There's a little tiny summary of it. That's what I experienced when I was dead. When I died, I took my sins, the sins of my world, with me, sending me into my own hell, where the divine fire of purgative love freed me from my bad karma, leaving me in pure light. When I was dead, I remembered, I saw, I was shown, I understood who I was, am.
and will be, pre-existent, just like the true you, just like the true Jesus, light from light. I came from heaven before this human birth. I knew, I saw, I understood, I lived, and I was shown the pre-existent, innocent nature of my own soul. I saw myself saved. I felt it. I was, I saw the same truth that has been shown to everyone, ultimately, in the near-death community, when they die. It's the same truth that will be shown to everyone when they die. I saw the same truth of my mom and my dad and for everyone living on earth. None of the ones I could see at that time could see what I was shown, but all of them would and will, when they die, will find their souls kissed too. I can only say what I saw and what I was shown, not make a theological argument. I saw universal and all-inclusive salvation that extends across all the universe to galaxies a billion light years distant, where they never heard of Jesus, where they never heard of Earth or Israel or humanity. Perhaps their primitive technology is like ours and it isn't interstellar. Well, the human Jesus could never visit there. And are they excluded from salvation? A couple of weeks ago, my Sunday title was, Do we have to believe in Jesus Christ to be saved? Jesus' belief in the extraterrestrials. Today's talk is built on that talk. Listen, Earth is an infinitesimally small, tiny dot, in the Hubble sphere of 13 billion point eight light years that we can currently see with that satellite, including at least two trillion galaxies. Did, did Jesus die to save them all if they never heard of Jesus, making belief in him impossible? Are the few Christians with the right beliefs the only ones saved? The universe is much bigger than belief. God is bigger than belief. Infinite love is bigger than all there is. Mercy and forgiveness and welcome and healing. The Jesus who saves the universe at crucifixion is a fiction. It never needed saving. It's always been saved, was, is, and will be, the universe is secretly made of love, and love makes it so. And the origin of yourself, you will see for yourself. I don't need to convince anyone for my own satisfaction. The door will open, and you'll see. When I came back to life, I took on the sins of the world again. I had no suffering in heaven, no sins, no wounds to give, no wounds I was given. But I was not cleaned by the blood, but by the light and love itself. The cleansing fire cleansed me, freeing me from my lower self. In heaven, I saw what Ephesians says. Accordingly, he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Right there in the Bible, I understood this. All is in love. Love chose me before. Love laid the foundation of the universe. Because of great love, I am pre-made of golden light. Love ordained me, saved me, redeemed me, showing me every living soul on earth and beyond as being the same eternally, all by extension, the all and all there is, the love itself. You too. I'm not special. It's all of us. And you can believe in Jesus as you want to. I'm not trying to convince anybody. 
Heck, he showed up and saved Howard Storm, who wasn't a Christian. The man Jesus was a no-show for me, but it didn't matter to me. Love and light infilled me. Christ consciousness was everything in the infinite. But like I said, Jesus was a no-show. Didn't need to be there. Light is all there is. What saved me was hearing, seeing, feeling, being overwhelmed by the self-evident, unconditional love. Did Jesus' death guide me into heaven? No. But his teachings helped. Love and light, kindness and hope, charity and joy, sharing and just being nice. Jesus never claimed to be God. Humans did that. I understood completely, with conviction, fully and unshakably. I know now, as I've always known, that I've been made of love since the foundation of the universe. I've always was and everlastingly will be saved. Not because of anything I've done, but because I made. I am now saved. The promise given to me when I came back. You can come back here. Forgiveness showed me I had always been blameless in love, always unstained in innocence. At our core, at the ground and the origin of our highest self, in our truest nature, we are light expressed from light, always pure, chosen and known before the foundation of the world, holy and blameless and beloved in love. In the King James Version, accordingly he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Ignore the patriarchy. Blameless in love. All of us are chosen. No exclusions. Not ever. Anywhere. Source chose us before the foundations of the universe were laid. Chosen as light, made as light, before material existence begins. Began. Begins always now. Jesus, he spoke like a near-death experiencer. He pointed out what he knew to be true. He sought heaven first above all things, and he loved his neighbor as himself. Jesus said, look, there is heaven. Here is heaven. If you want Jesus to be your savior, that's fine. If you want to believe in the salvation of humanity through the resurrection, that's fine. It'll do you a lot of good if you do, as long as you're not doing harm with it. But the love itself is self-evident on the other side. A heart of love and light leads directly home. And you don't have to take my word for it. You can listen to the thousands of near-death experiencers talking on YouTube. Or you can look inside your own heart. Or you can wait for your own death when the door will open and love will live again inside you as it always has since before the foundation of the universe before your arrival here. So thanks for listening today. I hope this helped. If it did, please like this video and subscribe. And thanks to everybody, everyone, for your weekly or monthly support on PayPal and Patreon. A special thanks to everybody who gives recurrently. Every gift helps. Go to peterpanagor.love to book a time with me if you want to talk to me personally. Counseling, guiding, conversation. My links are at peterpanagor.love. And you can join us for Mystic Tea Salon at the top of the hour. Link is below. 
So what's going on in the chat here? There are we. I'm going to get a drink of water and read a little bit of what's going on. Um, if you have a quick question for me, you can use that super chat thing. Um, where are we? Uh, thank you for the $5 there, super chat BE. Sorry, late as usual. Hello to everybody. Hey, Betty L. And I missed a whole, I missed saying hi to a whole bunch of people. I know I saw David pop in before I, I started this and Amy and, um, might you know what happens after death? I do know what happens after death. That's at least I know what happened after my death twice. Um, I was welcomed into the divine light through no action of my own. Nor of Jesus was a no show. Jesus shows up for a lot of people, but he didn't show up for me. Um, light is what mattered. Self evident love. Thank you, Peter. This conversation really helped to clarify salvation for me. That's good, Amy. That's what I was hoping. I'm hoping to spark conversation. That's what I'm trying to do. Let's talk about all this stuff. Uh, do we have to choose? Why have we chosen to separ to incarnate? Well, you know, that part is I'm a little blind to. People will tell you that it's to learn and have a lesson in life, and that probably is true for most people, but I, I I don't know that for a fact. I didn't experience that. I don't understand why I incarnated. And if I said that I did, I wouldn't be telling you the truth. I do know that um, I have a purpose in life. I also know that when I was dead, I, in comparison to my life as Peter, I, I knew immense amounts of information and knowledge far beyond anything my little tiny brain could contain here. So in terms of it being a school, I'm kind of, I feel like I'm in the dumb place now. Like I'm in the, like, I don't know what's going on place. I don't have all the information and I can't get it. And I can't, even if I had it, I couldn't, my brain isn't big enough to process it place. But when I was dead, nothing was beyond my grasp except for infinity itself. But everything that I wanted to know, I knew. So yes, I know what it's like after my death twice. And, and if you listen to near death experiencers, we're all kind of saying the same thing. A, a paper just came out, and um, I, geez, I wish I memorized who wrote it. But anyway, did a study, INS study, and in it, somewhere around 75 to 78 percent of the near-death experiences experiencers surveyed all came back with two words. Can you guess what they are? Two words to describe their experience. Okay, I'm going to tell you: love and light. And lots of these people weren't Christians. Lots of these people weren't even believers. It doesn't really matter. What's going to happen after death? Love and light. Especially if you keep your heart aimed there now. The more you experience love and light now, the easier it is when you cross over to cross over, to aim toward it. That's what Jesus was doing when he says, that's what he meant when he said, set your heart on heaven above all things and love your neighbor as yourself. Love God above all things. That's what he was saying. Aim your heart at light and love now. Live it in the world and find your way home when you go. Easy as a piece of pie. Why is that a saying anyway, easy as pie? What is it? Pie's not easy to make. It's easy to eat, but it's not easy to make. Not impossible. It just takes a little skill. Why am I talking about pies? Okay. I had several beings. Okay. The, the chat's just going and I'm just jumping in here. Um, Tim, I had several beings show up over a period of several months, including the devil. Well, I've encountered demons as well. I'd love to hear more about that, Tim. Uh, what I'm proposing is that NDEs are amazing, but what about occult connections? How ignorant are we or aren't we of the purpose of the light? Oh, the light is self-revealing, my friend, JD. It's, it, there's no trickery in it. When you're inside the light and you have no physicality, there's nothing invisible to you. Trust it if you want to. I can't convince you, and I can't argue anyone into it. It's self-evident when you go over. That's, I don't know what to say. 
I don't know what to say. You'll see for yourself. That whole thing about not trusting the light, that all comes from one particular line in the Bible that um, the devil can disguise himself as an angel of light. New Testament epistles. I suppose, but that's not what's going on in near-death experience. It's self-evidently the divine light. You'll see it for yourself and you'll know. You won't be questioning. There's no questioning. There's just experiencing. You'll see. Uh, let's see. I agree, love and light. I'm into that. Uh, Cat Light Sparkles, maybe we aren't here to learn, but to experience separateness and individuality and find our way back home from this experience. And that's the opposite of our true nature. I think that's close. That's I think that that's close because you ever wonder why near-death experiencers have life reviews? Like who's shooting the movie? The divine experiences all of life with us as we experience it. We are God in the world, experiencing the world in a billion ways on this planet, or however many people are on the planet now, seven billion, and, and multiply that out through all the galaxies um, of all the people out there. Um, that's a lot of experiencing this limited broken place. We're God here experiencing the world. And when we die, we are back to the back to heaven. Uh, let's see. I ask my friends who are atheist, do you believe in love? They always say yes. To me, that means they believe in God. Don't tell them, though. <laughs> They'll find out. Yeah. And more than believing in love, they experience it. Experiencing love. That's a powerful thing. Some of my best friends are atheists, and those best friends are the most loving people I know. It's amazing how that works. Blackberry pie is my favorite. Yeah, I love blackberry pie. The, 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 uh, you know, I gotta have a toothpick though, or blackberry pie, but I love blackberry pie too. Uh, yes, absolutely, JD. Great, thanks, man. Um, this is beautiful, Brooke B. So is Peter. Oh, shucks, thanks, blush. Um, I've always been captivated by his captivity to sh capacity, sorry. There you go. Okay. <laughs> There's irony. I've always been captivated by his capacity to share his light and experiences as I stumble through that sentence. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. Communication is the, my, my calling that's, but I've been, I'm, I'm here to be a communicator. I'm an imperfect communicator, obviously, but I'm doing the best I can with the tools I've got, but thank you very much. Let's see. Um, where were we? I lost my place again. You guys are chatting it up. That's great. Check, check on the time. Got a half an hour. Hi, Ronan. Hi. I just stumbled on this quote from Parapsychology Supplement in a Course in Miracles on Facebook that you'd like. Nor is belief in God a really meaningful concept. For God can be but known. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Belief is like the beginning of it all, maybe, for some. But it's a meaningless concept because it's a concept. You can only know the divine and be known by the divine. That is the problem. That's why we all, that's why we were here talking about it because it's very difficult to uh, explain the inexplainable. And it takes belief in structures to talk about it. Is that true? Let me think about that. I don't believe in the structures that I use in the language that I use to talk about it, but I use the structure of the language of belief to talk about that which can only be known. I think I got out of that little knot that I tied for myself. I think I untied that knot. Uh, but I love that quote. I'm going to say it again. Nor is belief in God a really meaningful concept, for God can be but known. 
that's it. And you get to be known by the knower when you know. It's this cyclical thing. It feeds on itself. Belief implies that unbelief is possible, but knowledge of God has no true opposite. Not to know God is to have no knowledge, and it is to this that all unforgiveness leads. I'm going to read that again. Belief implies that unbelief is possible, but knowledge of God has no true opposite. Not to know God is to have no knowledge. And it is to this that all unforgiveness leads. Yeah, okay, right. Exactly. Because, do, 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 I, do I need to explain that? Um, by not being known by God, you have no knowledge, and no knowledge of the divine leads to unforgiveness in the world. You know, you, you, people, we forgive each other for lots of reasons, but ultimately, forgiveness is love. It's just love. And if you know love, it's easier to forgive. Boy, that's a big subject. I'm going to walk away from that. That's, that's huge. It's way too... We'd have to explore that for an hour. But it's beautiful. I love that. And without knowledge, one can have only belief. Without knowledge, one can have only belief. That's it. You can only have belief. Brookby, Peter, do we get as many incarnations as we need to learn what we came for? I think so. I don't know. I've had a whole lot of incarnations. When I was dead, I knew everything I needed to know. Why do I keep coming back? Must be something I don't know. Um, I think what we need to learn, but I know I need to learn because I saw it when I was dead the first time. I need to learn the light. I need to learn to be in the light fully and completely without hesitation and the wholeness of my being, dead or alive. That's what I need. That's my aim. JD, okay, amazing. First time questioning with an NDE. -er. I'm pretty filled with fear and shame, but I try to love better. I have always had anxiety and panic. When I die, I'm scared of the transition. Well, you know, dying can suck. It can be, you know, there's just no way around it. It can be really pretty bad. But, you know, not always. Sometimes it's gentle and beautiful, too. I've seen that. Um, the fear leading up to it is, you can manage that. That's manageable through faith, through divine experience, through a lifetime of aiming your heart at heaven above all things. That's manageable. But it takes facing shadow now, so that there's less shadow to face then. If you ever want to talk about a JD, I'm around for that kind of thing. Hung around a lot of dying and death in my day as a pastor. Thank you, Lori, Mountain Girl. Thanks. Unforgiveness equals sin. Jesus talked about that. On your way to the judge, make up with your buddy before you get there. Love incorporates forgiveness. Yes, exactly, Lucia. Lori, this is why I dislike the Course in Miracles. It's always deciphering riddles. I like my spirituality at a third grade reading level. Jeez, I, I'm hoping I'm giving you that here, Lori. Um, yeah, the, the, the Course in Miracles is a complex book, uh, and it takes me a while to, like everybody else, i got to kind of work my way through the, the, the language. But that's true of, of most mystical books. But uh, I'm not as familiar with A Course in Miracles as I am with other books. So I appreciate it when people bring it in here so I can take a look inside. Love is here with us. We live in love but cannot see it for our troubles. Hide it. That's true, Michael. But also just being under the veil here hides it. Yeah, those two things. I'm there on the third grade level. That's funny and sweet, Laurie, says, uh, peace, love, goddess. Absolutely. Thank you, Peter, JD. You're welcome. I like that cat light. Um, Gritru, Gritrui. Mm, many subjects are touched on in this talk. Too difficult to write truth in one or two lines. Yeah, see, that's one of the things I worry about in my talks is that I cover too much ground. 
uh, they, they'd have to be shorter and uh, to cover less ground to make them narrower. Because every every everything that I touch on's got like a, a an entire highway system off of it that I could go down that highway system. It happened to me when I was rewriting this morning. I was like, oh, I could go down this route. You know, talk about what I you know what I how I experience what suffering and sin is. And and in heaven and on earth and in the divine realm that I got and I was like, uh, I can't go down that route. <laughs> That's way too big. It's yeah, the Bible's a riddle too. Uh, the Bible's a riddle for the same reason, of course, and the miracles are riddle. The same reason that that it, that what I was just saying is difficult because it's so complex. That's why the super simplicity of love and light is all you really need to know. All I really need to know, not all this other stuff. Not all the book knowledge, not the analytics and the systematics and the dedu deductions and reasoning and all that stuff, which is fine, um, but it it doesn't bring one the light and the love. Only human relationship and interior relationship to the divine brings that kind of thing in increasing abundance. And it does come in increasing abundance. Uh, I wonder about people who have serious mental illness and can't have a normal experience. Yeah, you know what? They shed their skin when they go home and all the details of their difficulties get shed along with it. They're not responsible for the DNA. You're not responsible for your DNA. You know, you, you get what you get. And mental illness is a real serious problem. But when you have no brain in death, you have no mental illness. Listening to you and learning makes the dying process and understanding easier. Our Fox, thanks. I'm trying. Amy, you don't cover too much ground. Every talk you have some insight and thoughts to meditate on. I just love the way you present it. Thank you, Amy. Kind of streamy. Um, um, no, you got it right, depth. Thank you, Hugo. Uh, gold nuggets, thanks, R Fox. I don't need to understand. It's all good, capital G, Wanda. Yeah, all you need to do is love, love, love. Do, do, do. How often do you do this, Peter? I'm loving this. My new church every single Sunday morning, and I'm so glad that you are every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. And during the week, I might put out a, some other video if I if I can. I have the chance to. And on Mondays and Wednesdays, we have live stream meditation practice, centering prayer, some Kriya Yoga. And on Tuesdays, that's on YouTube. And on Tuesdays, we do that on Zoom. But yes, every week, Brooke. And there's a whole bunch of um, other videos that precede this particular one. That like I said, it's a series. It it all builds. Uh, it builds. The whole not church is a series, a progressive series. I understand everything you say, including that love is the essential message in practice, but I also think that there is more to it. Well, what do you think? Tell me. In, in, in Either here in the chat or in the comments. What do you consider a serious mental illness? I had severe suicidal depression for 21 years. Well, that's certainly debilitating. Uh, that's pretty serious. Um, I, I knew a young man once who had a virus living in his brain that made him think that he was, I swear to God, Napoleon. And that was a serious brain illness. Yeah, I'm not a clinician. So, but depression and suicidal ideation is a tough thing. It's, it, it, people die from that. But lots of people live with it. Manage it. People who are more analytical benefit from more complex spiritual teachings. Glad that it's there for them. Yeah, that's true. I'm with CA. Happy to be sitting here with you. Thanks, Michael. I'm become. I'm going to become a regular too, JD. Thanks, man. Um, if or woman. Don't know if you're a man or a woman or something else, a gender. They even. Um, and an interesting side note here, when the second time I died, my angel came talking to me in the pearl, plural. Um, we have been waiting for you. It's time for you to come home to us, not the singular. 
and of course there was no gender. Um, you overcame your suicidal depression with spiritual life. Yeah, me too. I was a busboy as a teen, Jim says. One day I badly injured a waitress. It was an accident. I still felt bad about it when I blamed myself for hurting others, even unintentionally feeling cut off from the light. It's a hard thing, Jim, to feel those kind of feelings. When I, I have an event in my life that's similar, I hurt somebody that I didn't mean to, um, to change the course uh, of lives. And it was an accident. I pray for him and myself by sending light to him and love to him and to me. Oh, let's see. Shame is really hard. I had a lot of that, and it still gets me every once in a while. Yep. Shame is an internalization of a social idea. People make you feel shame. God does not make you feel shame. There is no shame in heaven. None. Only light. Only love. Well, Peter, this is like I'm looking at two of you. One of you is pure light, bright, and it's amazing. And Peter, I can feel it a powerful. It must be my lights, Rob. I've got <laughs> it's gotta be the lights. But thanks, man. Um I a serious mental illness is one which brings you into this life and gets you the idea and stick with it and then becoming a mass murderer. Oh, okay. Yeah. That is a serious mental illness. That's true, Michael. I, I am not a clinician, but I'm going to agree with you there. Um, yeah. I'm going to check the time here. 42. I struggle with greatly with those that commit such evil atrocities, such as child murder. Oh, yeah. Yet we are supposed to be from love and light. Are there not consequences in the end? I, I sat on the state of Maine's domestic violence homicide review panel for quite a number of years, and I read a lot of case files about that very same thing, and with color slides and detectives presenting and discussion and I, I'm not there. I, I wasn't there to judge their eternity. That's up to them and the divine. If you want them to suffer, or if you want them to be healed, what difference does either one of those positions make in what actually happens to them? I send such people love as best I can. And some of these crimes were heinous crimes. I mean, these are real serious things. And many of these people are in prison or they double suicided or triple suicided suicide and two murders at their very core just like all the rest of us they're still made of love and what i pray for them is that love prevails some of them have mental illness some of them have mental illness and genetics some of them have mental illness genetics and environmental it doesn't excuse the behavior but it doesn't want to make me send them to hell either that's up to them and the divine as jesus said who made me judge i was all in favor of the prosecution The angel might have been a whole collective. Yeah, it could have been Lucia. I could have been. I had a period of time when I was clinically depressed. It did end and I grew a lot from the experience. Spirituality was the answer for me too, says Laurie. It's funny how that works, huh? God spirituality, yeah. Uh, let's see. Clint, same thing here, depression. Gateway into spirituality. So we're seeing a pattern here that, remember that the, two weeks ago I quoted this poem from Rumi, 
that ailments become openings for God's mercy. Something like that. Maybe upon entering this reality, some souls volunteer to be the antagonist. Somebody's got to play the bad guy, maybe, Wanda. Or maybe it's just the way nature is. You know, sometimes the bad guy is the good guy on the other side. So when the... In the American genocide against Native Americans, we demonized the natives. We made them into the bad guy. But from their point of view, we were the bad guy. Sometimes it's like that. Do we volunteer to cause pain? I think everybody does that. Everybody gets to cause pain when they come here. Some of it's greater and some of it's lesser, but nobody gets away with not, including Jesus. Maybe you want to check out the infancy gospel of Thomas, where Jesus kills a kid and also brings a clay bird to life. God gives us what we need. Sometimes it comes in the form of accidents. Yep. All right, here's, I'm going to read this to myself first. I'll show that. Rowan says, uh, there are many, he gave me the option kindly. Thank you for giving me the kind option to show or not. Uh, there are many companion books in the Course in Miracles, including one by Jesus himself, apparently that is called Raj Material, available for free with the course itself at Christmind.com. Oh, I'm sorry, Christmind.info. I think that's supposed to be info. Thank you so much for speaking on shame. What you said was so helpful. You are, you're welcome, Rachel. It, uh, yep, thanks, dot info. Where'd it go? I lost my, my slide. There we are. 25% of the world's population mental illness at some time in some stage in their lives is Charlie, a clinician over there in Ireland. The vast majority are not dangerous. Mass murderers do not have to have mental illness to do bad things. True, true. One agrees before coming to the world to, to be the victims, others, perpetrators. I've pondered this a lot, I suppose. I don't know. Um, I don't know. That could be true. Uh, it's just outside my experience. I didn't, I didn't get shown that when I was dead. And so I have no position on it because I don't know. But what you're saying could be true. Let's stop stigmatizing mental illness. And, and yes, I am a cl clinician. Yeah. Mental illness is not a terrible thing. I mean, I, I, I've had suicidal ideation as a result of my NDE. One of my best friends has mental illness. Still a beautiful person. It's a brain thing. It's like, you know, I, I, I broke my thumbnail yesterday. It just broke. And, and that's what happens. It's a part of my body. The brain is just a part of the body. It's part of being human. I'm in agreement with Charlie, 100%. If, soul, if the soul chooses to come to learn the lessons. This is the most interesting group I've been involved with. Love the comments. Then you should try the Mystic Tea Salon after at the top of the hour. The link is below because that's where this conversation really gets in depth because it's a conversation. Lots of people taking a chance to express their thoughts and their wisdom. It's a humble conversation. Brother Ed. Hey, Brother Ed. Hope you're doing well out there in Oklahoma. Um, the flow of wisdom and compassion in this message of love is transforming my fears and guilts. Well, it's the love and the light that's doing that because you've got a heart open to it, Ed. Gail, I feel healing from heinous crimes must come from within. I pray for them also. It's on them to judge themselves when they pass. Probably. That's at least for, that's what happened to me. That's all I can say. It happened to me. I judged myself and I was fortunate enough to be able to turn to the light. Murderers and the like are already, in my opinion, in hell. I had a spiritual experience around this with Christ. Christ loves them and all so much with no judgment, only pure love. Yeah, I think that that's tr probably true, Rachel. I know that lots of people who go to war 
and who fight on uh, a side always feel pain after killing. And it brings home a hell with them. Yep. For instance. Okie dokie, the, the cracks are where the light comes in. It was Rumi, Ellen, the cracks are where the light comes in. It was Rumi who wrote that. That is what is happening now in this country. Two bad guys, two sides. What's going to bridge the gap? Love. I don't know what else can do that other than that. Thanks, true, no test has overtaken you, but such that is common to man, the human condition, says Wanda. Love that, Ellen, says Victoria. Michael, wait, Jesus kills a kid? Citation, please. It's in the Infancy Gospel of Thomas. Infancy Gospel of Thomas. Just Google it. It's on Wikipedia. Um, it's a non-canonical book, and in it there are other adventures Jesus has when he's a kid. It does it fall into the same category as, say, the infancy narrative in the Gospel of Luke? Um, maybe. We don't really know if either of those actually happened. There's a lot of suspicion that they didn't. But one of the things I like about the infancy Gospel of Thomas is that Jesus is a human being. He's just a person. And yeah, he kills a kid, but he, you know... I've, when I was a kid, this is how I, I how I think about this. When I was a kid, oh yeah, there was definitely a kid I wanted to like. Well, I'm gonna murder that kid when I was like seven years old or eight years old. Um, but you know, when Jesus says it, it just kind of happens. Um, that's the way the story goes. And but what I really like about the infancy gospel of Thomas is that it humanizes Jesus. He's not above sin. He sins. He's like us. That's what I love about the gospel, the infancy gospel of Thomas. He's a human being. And as we talked about in a previous video, where we talked about the gospel of Mark being an account of his spiritual awakening journey, thanks to Adyashanti and the book Resurrecting Jesus, we can see that a regular human being can go on a spiritual journey and end up enlightened. It's worth reading, that's for sure. The only way to transform a criminal is to bring more light into his or her life. They lack light and that's why they did what they did in the first place. As best we can. And there are some people that just reject the light and you can't bring it to them. You gotta want it. It's kind of like a horse in a water thing. Um, and often that happens with brokenness. The more broken you become, the easier it is for the light to get in, Ellen and Rumi. Would you please expound on what you just said about Jesus killing a kid? Yeah, I hope that helped. I just did. Uh, I wasn't stating a fact about perpetrators and victims. I was stating my ponderings to Wanda for the record. Very good, Lucio. Thank you for clarifying. Appreciate that. Yes, please. Oh, yes, of course. The Jesus thing. Mystic Tea. Mystic Tea Salon. Brilliant, thanks. It's it's a collective. It's great because everybody participates with the wisdom that they bring from their mystical experience and its humility. The, the sign of a, a true mystical experience is the humility that comes with it. And part of that, okay, if you had a visitation from the dead, and I only have a couple of minutes here, and then I'm going to, I'll see you there. And I definitely didn't get down the whole chat list. But if you have a visitation from the dead, and you have a direct communication of love and well-being, and then you try to tell somebody you more likely sound like a fool than you do a wise person. Oh yeah, my auntie came to visit me and I now know that all is well. Now, if someone has that experience, they're gonna be like, oh yeah, me too, my brother came to me. But if they haven't had that experience and they don't really understand that the world has spirituality in it, they might be like, and you get enough of those and suddenly you're like, zip those lips, zip those lips even though the wisdom continues to live inside you, even though your life course changes as a result, even though you now know your deceased loved one still lives and it's evidenced by the angle that your grief moves from that point on. 
what am I talking about? I'm talking about Mystic Tea Salon and a place to talk about that because that experience comes with humility. It's the humility of knowing on your inside and not being able to say it on the outside. That's a humility. All right, my friends, I got to go. I got five minutes. I got to take a little break. Peace and love to you all. Thanks for being here this morning. Um, Peter, my cousin, died a few weeks ago, and he is no longer with us. Do you believe in a proven method to contact him? Maybe he'll come to visit you, JD. That sometimes happens. My dad came to visit me a couple of weeks. Uh, my niece, uh, Dina, I shouldn't mention names. Um, she said that her mom comes to visit her pretty often. So maybe come to visit you. Uh, Suzanne Geisman, the medium, has lots of success. There are mediums who actually do contact the dead. And there are mediums who pretend to contact the dead. And I'm not an expert in that whatsoever. But I'm going to go. Peace and love to you all. Thank you for being here. I'll see you at Mystic Tea Salon. Link is below. And talk to you then. See you soon. Peace and love, everybody. Thanks for showing up. And thanks for your support. Mm. De nada. Carmen. Peace.